Chapter Fourteen of Spiders by Cecil Warburton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Enemies of Spiders. When one comes to consider the multitudinous risks to which a spider is exposed during the whole course of its life, it seems at first a little surprising that the whole tribe has not long ago been exterminated spiders continue to flourish however and it is very clear that however careless nature may be of the individual she is extremely solicitous about the race the infant mortality among these creatures must be appalling there is first their cannibalistic propensity to be reckoned with newly hatched spiders while still within the cocoon seldom attack each other but as soon as ever each sets up for himself no quarter is given it often happens that members of a brood of sedentary spiders spin their first snares in close contiguity and if food is scarce they eat one another without compunction it is said that a few individuals of a brood may be reared to maturity on no other food than their sisters and brothers the case of the survivor of the nancy bell in the bab ballads would be exceedingly commonplace in the araniad world we have seen too how on occasion a tippus will devour her young if they do not leave the nest with due expedition then if the weather conditions chance to be unfavorable just at the period of departure from the cocoon broods are liable to perish wholesale washed away and destroyed by deluges of rain myriads too must be carried out to sea in the course of their ballooning operations and never come safely to land but the mortality is probably even greater at a still earlier stage for hosts of spiders eggs never hatch at all and this for two reasons in the first place the silk of spiders is a favorite material with many birds for the lining of their nests and many of them use the cocoons for this purpose secondly there are numerous ichneumon flies which attack and parasitize spiders cocoons piercing them with their ovipositors and laying their eggs inside the eggs of the ichneumon fly hatch first and feed upon the eggs of the spider two such flies are known to attack the cocoons of the garden spider and not a single spider will emerge from a cocoon thus parasitized the spiders whose cocoons are most subject to these attacks belong as might perhaps be expected to the sedentary groups and the most elaborate but unavailing precautions are often taken to render them ichneumon proof the cocoons of the peripatetic wolf spiders have never been observed to be parasitized even if a spider has survived these early perils there are still many dangers ahead during its period of growth it has to molt some eight or nine times and the operation is at least as dangerous as say an attack of measles to the human infant for some time beforehand feeding ceases and the animal becomes inert and apparently dead but presently the integument splits and out struggles the spider pale and soft and leaving behind it not only the outer skin but the lining of most of its alimentary canal and of its breathing tubes sometimes as we have said it fails to extricate itself and dies quite often it emerges with the loss of a limb which will reappear reduced in size at the next molt it is necessary to go into retreat for a time after molting till strength has returned and the integument has hardened but the dangers of molting though not negligible are insignificant 
beside others to which the spider is exposed during its later stages nor is a prolonged dearth of food necessarily fatal for as we have seen a spider can fast for an astonishing time and yet retain its health if it has a fair supply of water but there are terrible enemies at hand from which it has little or no protection birds of course come first for to most insectivorous birds spiders are acceptable morsels i have seen a hedge sparrow going conscientiously over a trellis work and picking out all the spiders from the nooks and corners then insectivorous mammals make no distinction between the insecta and the arachnida and often eat spiders with avidity as also will toads and lizards moreover ichneumon flies do not confine their attention to cocoons but often attack well-grown spiders they invariably lay their eggs on one spot at the very front of the abdomen near the cephalothorax where the spider is powerless to dislodge them the egg hatches out to a grub which is a veritable old man of the sea on the spider's back and there it remains until it causes the death of the victim by feeding on the contents of the abdomen four such ichneumon flies have been found to attack the garden spider and no kind of spider seems exempt how they contrive to deposit their eggs in the proper place without great danger of themselves falling a prey to their victims is a mystery to venture into a garden spider's web for the purpose would seem a foolhardy proceeding the actual deposition of the egg has seldom been witnessed but in one of the few cases that have come under observation the spider made little resistance and appeared quite demoralized it was hanging from a thread down which the ichneumon fly was seen to crawl when it reached the spider the latter dropped an inch lower on two or three occasions but then remained passive and the parasite on nearing it turned round backed down the line and with great care and deliberation attached an egg at the usual spot but no enemies of spiders are more terrible than some of the solitary wasps and gruesome indeed is the fate of any creature that falls into their clutches the social wasps often capture spiders to feed their young but in their case the proceeding is summary and without any finesse they merely catch a spider sting it to death cut it to pieces with their jaws and feed it into the mouths of their expectant grubs the treatment is brutal enough but at all events it is expeditious now the solitary digger wasps never see their young they make cells either by burrowing in the ground or by agglomerating particles of mud or gravel and in each cell is placed an egg together with sufficient food to last the grub which hatches out for the whole of its larval existence the mother will not be at hand as is the social worker wasp to supply new food as required and it is therefore necessary so to arrange matters that the food provided may retain its fresh condition for at least a fortnight on the other hand the victims must be deprived of all power of motion otherwise the egg will stand a great chance of being displaced and crushed and even if it hatches it will be unable to commence its meal upon the struggling spider now in the whole range of animal instinct there is nothing more remarkable than the manner in which the solitary wasps have learnt to solve this problem the solution lies in so stinging the victim that it is paralyzed but not killed and though quite unable to move it neither shrivels nor decays 
but remains perfectly sound and edible for two or three weeks to accomplish this result the wasp acts as though it possessed a knowledge of the minute anatomy of its victim and knew to a hair's breadth the position of the principal nerve ganglia which controls its actions into these it unerringly thrusts its sting but even accuracy of aim is not everything there must be the finest discrimination in the severity of the wound a slight excess and the animal is killed to timid a thrust will not destroy movement when the delicate operation has been successfully performed the paralyzed spider is dragged into the cell placed on its back and an egg carefully deposited at the base of its abdomen after which the cell is sealed up some wasps instead of providing a single large spider store their cells with a number of smaller victims all rendered limp and motionless in attacking a spider the first action of one of these wasps is to remove it from its natural environment a garden spider in its web or a burrowing spider in its tunnel are more or less formidable but if the one can be thrown down or the other dragged forth into the open they are well nigh defenceless therefore in attacking an epirid the wasp first darts at it seizes a leg and attempts to jerk it out of the web if unsuccessful the spider will now be on its guard and the wasp leaves it and tries the same maneuver on another individual taken by surprise it is instantly thrown to the ground and can then offer no effectual resistance even the large bird eaters fall victims to these terrible foes end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of spiders by cecil warburton this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Some Concluding Reflections In the foregoing pages, we have been able to deal with very few out of the vast number of known spiders. Yet the examples we have chosen for study are fairly typical of some of the more important groups, and calculated to give a tolerably just idea of the general economy of the tribe in any case even such a fragmentary study as the present gives us food for thought there is a question which the writer has so often been asked that he is inclined to deal with it in anticipation though perhaps he is wronging his readers in supposing that they desire to propound any such conundrum this question is what is the use of spiders now underlying this question there is surely a very unwarranted assumption that all the myriad creatures which exist have as a reason for their existence some reference to the activities and desires of mankind as far as it has any meaning at all it amounts to this what benefit does man derive from spiders but it seems to take for granted that some benefits must accrue to man from these creatures or that they would not have the audacity to persist in living well if the question in this amended form is in urgent need of an answer the reply must be very little if any certainly spiders prey as a rule on insects and no doubt kill many which might injure us and in the constant battles between man and insect pests instances have been recorded where particular species of spider have fought on the side of man with appreciable effect but then they are as likely to devour our insect friends as our insect enemies impartially slaying the just together with the unjust 
so that little stress can be laid on their utility on this score indeed there is quite as good a case to be made out of man benefiting spiders as of spiders benefiting man for his architectural proclivities have provided some species with secure homes from which most of their enemies except man himself are excluded and where they are sheltered from the storms which are so fatal to their relatives outside protected from extremes of temperature and rendered so independent of times and seasons that the number of broods they produce in the year has increased whether a creature is useful or injurious is entirely a matter of the point of view there are several animals with regard to which the opinions of the farmer and the gamekeeper are diametrically opposed but if anything emerges from the study in which we have been engaged it is surely this fact that wherever there is a niche in nature capable of sustaining life to that niche some animal will sooner or later adapt itself without any reference to man's desires or interests we have seen spiders all built on the same ground plan so to speak and with the same essential organs so modified in the details of structure and inherited instincts as to be able to thrive under the most diverse conditions think for instance of the water spider and the desert tarantula or consider the difference in mode of life between the sedentary garden spider and the hunting attid incessant competition in the struggle for life no doubt urged on primeval spiders to strike out new modes of existence under slightly novel conditions the best adapted or most adaptable survived and were pioneers in the occupation of a new territory till the widely different capacities and habits which we now wonder at were slowly evolved another point to ponder on is the wonderful complexity of the instincts which govern the actions of spiders the extraordinary operations they can perform entirely untaught and of the object of which it is impossible to believe they are aware we have seen that in the most highly organized species the sense organs except perhaps that of touch are but moderately developed and the power of memory the basis of intelligent action but feeble yet their inherited impulses suffice for all ordinary emergencies and recur with unfailing precision at the proper periods of their lives they are machine-like perhaps but what extraordinarily competent machines the light of what we call intelligence burns low but a glimmer of it can be detected here and there if one comes to think of it the egg of a creature of complex instincts is a particularly wonderful atom it contains not only the germs of all the complicated bodily structure but there are bound up in it also the impulses that are to come into play at certain definite periods only of the spider's life history and these impulses are not mere vague reminders that now is the time to spin a snare or to weave an egg cocoon they prescribe precisely how it is to be done involving perhaps a dozen different spinning operations in one in varying order viewed in this light the germ of an insect or a spider would seem in a sense to be more complex than that of an animal whose vague instinctive impulses are under the direction of intelligence and can be carried out in a variety of ways according to circumstances one of the most surprising things about the egg of a spider is the amount of energy stored up in it a bird's egg huge in comparison contains material sufficient to build up the body of a fledgling just sufficiently active to be able to accept 
from the mother that first nutriment without which it will speedily die but turn back to the account of the tarantula spider its egg is small perhaps the twelfth of an inch in diameter and yet it not only produces a spiderling complete in form and provided with all the complex instincts of its tribe but there is so much energy to spare that for months without any new food supply the young spider can lead an active life frequently descending from and remounting its mother's back and can even put forth silk on its own account the objects which a conjurer produces from a hat seem trifles in comparison with the outcome of a spider's egg the actual material seems astonishing from so small a source but whence comes all this surprising surplus of energy fabre suggests that it is supplied by the direct rays of the sun to which the tarantula exposes in turn all parts of the egg cocoon all through their lives spiders seem to be gifted in a high degree with the power of extracting the utmost value in substance and in energy from their food consider the great theraphosid spiders the so-called bird eaters they have a massive body and great muscular power to sustain yet they are never heavy feeders and can go for many months without any food at all and it is not as though they were dormant during this period of abstention their vital processes seem to be going on as usual the whole time and they are ready at any moment to resent attack or to employ their spinning organs during their long fast true hibernation as we have seen does not occur in this group if it did there would be nothing remarkable in the occasional long abstention from food the vitality of a hibernating animal is practically at a standstill all its vital operations breathing blood circulation muscular action are reduced to the lowest possible limit and it very likely expends no more energy during its winter sleep than it would during a day or two of active summer life but of such reflections there is no end and many such will doubtless arise spontaneously in the mind of the thoughtful reader and it is for that very reason that the study of the life history of any animal is of such absorbing interest it is not contended that spiders are any more wonderful than any other group that might have been selected there is of course a special interest attaching to the study of animals very much nearer to man in bodily structure and mental equipment but the endeavor to understand the actions and appreciate the outlook on nature of creatures far remote from man however unsuccessful has its own fascination and this is what the mere collector entirely misses collecting is of course necessary for a complete examination is never possible in the living specimen and moreover without examples kept as types for reference we should lose our way in the multitude of living forms but as an end in itself it is of vastly inferior value the writer will be well content if he has succeeded in arousing the curiosity of some with regard to the humble life that surrounds us and in stimulating a few who possess the requisite keenness and patience to add to our store of knowledge by new observations of their own end of chapter fifteen end of spiders by cecil warburton read for librivox by sue anderson